Welcome to the Tyler's Place podcast, the official podcast of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, Southern Jurisdiction. I am your host, Matt Bowers, 32nd degree. You may recognize me from the Scottish Rite Journal podcast. That's where I spend most of my time. But right now, I'm going to be speaking with Brother Bill Turner, 33rd degree. Who's Brother Bill Turner? Well, You could say he's a man of many hats. Brother Bill is a veteran of the United States Air Force. He is currently the Grand Tyler for the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, but he is also a member of the National Sojourners, which is an appendant body of Freemasonry centered around military service. He is a past national president, as well as in the years 2003 and 2004, a commander of the Heroes of 76. That's a program that we'll actually discuss during the podcast. We'll talk about the troubles and highlights of the National Sojourners, their mission statement of Americanism and patriotism, their work with youth organizations, and a whole lot more. Truth be told, I didn't know anything about the National Sojourners until a brother at my Blue Lodge asked me some questions about them. He had just recently joined them and wanted to learn a little bit more, and I wanted to learn a little bit more. And what better way to learn a little bit more than to talk to someone who's been active in that organization for a long time. And by active, you'll know exactly what I mean when you listen to him. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Brother Bill Turner. I want to thank you for for doing this today. I really appreciate you taking the time to to sit down with us. Um, If you can, take a minute and give us a little bit of your personal background, your Masonic and military, as well as a brief history of what the National Sojourners are all about. Oh, okay. I can do that. I'm a native to the Northern Virginia, D.C. area. In fact, I was born in the District of Columbia, Um, but my folks lived out in Northern Virginia and just a situation where my mother decided to go shopping and I decided to be born. (laughs) So that's why it happened that way. But sometimes, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, I graduated from Fairfax High School, went down to Virginia Tech and wasn't doing particularly good and didn't want to continue to spend my dad's money. Mm -hmm. So I went, uh, I had just gotten a greetings letter from the United States Army uh, I knew what was inside. It said DOD on the outside. So yeah. when I got the letter, I didn't even open it. I went down to the Air Force recruiter and said, here we go. So that translated into my military career beginning. Mm-hmm. But get back on my personal part of it first is that I then later on went back to school. I graduated from the George Washington University, did my part of my graduate work at GW, Lived there for fundamentally, except for my military time, lived there for 72 years. We moved down here to South Carolina nine years ago, and Mm -hmm. we're loving it. It's wonderful. I get my four seasons, and Patty gets away from 12 degrees. Masonically, uh, my mother lodge is John Blair Lodge, which meets in the Alexandria Scottish Rite. Mm -hmm. I'm a late bloomer in that. I was raised on my 36th natal birthday. So unique situation there where my natal birthday and my Masonic birthday are the same. Right. Wow. Um, It just happened that way. Then my instructor said, when do you want to stand your examination? Mm -hmm. Said, that's up to you. You tell me. And he said, how about the 8th of November? And I said, sure, that's pretty special. He said, yeah, it's special. All right. I said, well, it's more special because it's my birthday. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I wonder how like that. We got to chuckle out of that. Yeah. I wonder how often that actually happens though. That if, if a brother gets the opportunity to be, to be raised on the the day that he was born, that's be curious to know. Yeah. It would be interesting to know, but I must admit, I have not run into any other brother that's of the same circumstance. In the course of my time, I've belonged to and am a part of a number of different Masonic organizations, Scottish Rite, York Rite, Shrine, etc. cetera, Paul Cedars, Eastern Star, you, mm-hmm. you get the picture. Yeah. Then in addition to that, I found myself going to a Scottish Rite meeting and thoroughly enjoying the meeting. And then they had a program and the program, inter- coincidentally, was put on by the National Sojourners. It was the historical flag program, which we'll probably talk about later a little bit anyway. Mm-hmm. But I was so intrigued by that. I went down and asked one of the presenters. I said, 
hey, what organization is this? And, and is it possible that I can become a part of it? And he described that it was the National Sojourners and um, what they do and what they stand for. And of course, Americanism and patriotism. And I said, yeah, I'd like to be a part of that if I can. And the rest is history. I align myself very strongly, very heavily with the Scottish Rite and with the National Sojourners. On the National Sojourners side of things, uh, I've been the past national, I am a past national president of the organization in 11 and 12. And then in addition to that, uh, in 2003 and 2004, I was the national commander of the Heroes of 76, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Sure. Um, so, and and I'm a past trustee. I'm a trustee emeritus of Sojourners, etc. In the Scottish Rite, of course, uh, you've probably already done your research. I am a 33rd degree IGH, which I was very surprised, uh, as I'm sure other brothers can say the same thing. But then I had the added honor and privilege of being tapped to be the Grand Tyler to the Supreme Council. And uh, that was distinctly an honor, which I continue to hold as Sovereign Grand Commander Cole has indicated he wants me to continue at this session that we just had. So, I, you know, I, I get myself involved in Scottish Rite yeah. as well. Uh, that's pretty much it. Now, the Sojourners, you want to talk about the history of the Sojourners a little bit? Sure, please. Our, our legend has it that we began back in the Spanish-American War. But again, as I said, that's legend. After doing some research, we come to find out that although some of the players that were in the Philippines at the time mm -hmm. found themselves in Chicago, Illinois, in the time frame of 1912, 1911 time frame, and they decided that they wanted to have a Sojourners Club. Fast forwarding then a little bit, we found ourselves at uh, getting a charter from the city of Chicago to stand up the National Sojourners Organization, which we did. That was in 1919 mm -hmm. that we actually stood that up, the organization, and it's evolved into what it is today. And in the shortest terms, we have now about 160 chapters and about 7,000 members. We had a heyday in the 40s and 50s, and the organization was up to 9,000 members, but a number of reasons have caused that to decline a little bit, which we'll sure. also talk on in a little bit, I'm sure. You know, you talked about the heyday of, of the Sojourners, which I think in fraternal organizations, that period um, after World War II, was, there, were, there was a lot of that in general. You know? Yes, there was. So and but, we enjoyed that very same circumstance. Yeah. Uh, Having, having, and I mean it favorably, not derogatorily, we had a glut, mm -hmm. and, uh, the glut of Masons. But in addition to that, we had the attention of the presidents, several of the presidents of the United States in evolving to that time frame. Yeah. Members such as John J. Pershing, uh, for example, as, as a single example, mm -hmm. we had the chief of naval operations, we had the chief of staff of the military, uh, just and lots of other dignitaries of the military. Right, right. And, well, and, and you said you've, you've, you know, back in its heyday, as you said, you know, with the, the, the numbers and membership and how it's, it's declined, you know, what, what do you think is the biggest hurdle today for the sojourners? And, and is, is there a way, you know, either short term or long term that is there a best way that can positively affect that? Membership is clearly the biggest hurdle that we have, and I think that's true for not just Masonic organizations, but even civil organizations, the Rotary Club uh, and the like. Um, and the, the issue in the American Legion on the military lending side of it, if you will, mm -hmm. I think that's key. I think that's important. And we've gotten away from back in the late 40s and 50s where – Typically, a family had a wife that stayed home, made babies, took care of the babies, saw uh -huh. to it, everything was fine, and the husband was the breadwinner of the family. 
Well, our economy and our social circumstances have evolved from that to now. We even have, as you know, husbands and wives that are both working. And in some cases, they have more than one job. And they need to have that to be able to keep their economic solvency of the family unit. Having said that, then, what is the key to all of that? The key is time. That's the most precious commodity we have in our lives is time. And we're challenged by that. Mm -hmm. The American Legion, the Rotary Club, these other organizations, they're challenged the same way we are. How do you get a brother to even come into masonry when you tell him, hey, it's going to require all of this study on your part on the front end until you become a master mason. And then we want you to be a, a meaningful part of the lodge. And he does he have time? And then uh, you run into that same situation of do they have the time to then be a part of the sojourners? And if you want to, if I may extend on that, in in, in masonry in general, you have to do the things that are appropriate in masonry to be that better man, okay? For and sure. you have to be able to convince the person that you're talking to that that's the kind of thing that we are trying to do in masonry, is to teach you all of the values that are important to being a meaningful and integral part of society and perpetuate what our country really represents and stands for. Masonry can do that, but you have to convince them of that if they don't already have that seed planted in their upbringing. And I, I just, that's that's where I am with it. I, I feel that you talk to a brother or a potential brother and you tell him what it is that masonry can do and that, yeah, maybe there are some peripheral benefits, but that's not the reason that you join Freemasonry. You join right. Freemasonry for love of God, for love of country, love of flag, and all of the virtuous words that you can plug in at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what is his focus? What is his wish and desire? I'd rather you go to lodge, learn something on the degree work, be a part of the lodge and its community associations and affiliations mm -hmm. and the things that you can do for helping the community. But you're more than likely not just sitting there and staring at a television set. You're more than likely engaging with your brethren and exchanging ideas and what is it that we can do for the community? And just a single example because it's on the threshold and now something that we are beginning to discuss. Right. And that is let's sell Christmas trees. Sure. Okay. As a fundraiser for the law, sell, sell Christmas trees. Okay, which guys are going to take which shifts and who's going to go buy the trees? Who's going to help set their yard up ready to put the Christmas trees in the yard? Mm -hmm. They can be seen by the general public because they're going by those kinds of things. Likelihood of him falling asleep on his feet are slim to none. Right. <laughs> That's, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you for sure. Lay, you lay down and watch Netflix, and I guarantee you the average bear has worked so hard, he's going to fall asleep while he's watching a Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and that's just, an, it obviates itself. Yeah. But then well, the other part of it is when he does finally get home after being at Lodge, he finally does get home. When he falls asleep, he's going to be a stone. He's yeah. going to sleep like a rock and not lay there and flip-flop all night long. That's that's for sure. That is that is definitely for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and I think what you're touching upon there is a, is a level, you know, when, when you talk about bringing new members in is a level of leadership. Um, yeah. and, and leadership isn't necessarily the, you know, the guy at the top, good leaders are, are everywhere. Yes. And excuse me, some people don't want to be necessarily, necessarily the leader at the top. They can, they can affect things, you know, in the middle. So, and, and with that, uh, that kind of leads me to what I wanted to ask next, or, you know, what do you find are the good qualities of either a good military leader from your military background and, and a good Masonic leader? I would narrow it down in both of those venues. I would narrow it down to two things. One is that you are a knowledgeable and intelligent person on whatever the subject matter is, whether it's masonry or the military and what you're doing in the military mm -hmm. or that focus in the Masonic arena. And the other thing is team building, the skills and abilities to be a team builder. If you have the knowledge 
and you have the ability to communicate with your brothers and develop a nice, wonderful team, then you're going to not only be respected by your peers, but you're going to be followed by those that want to be followers. There's a lot of them that don't want their, their participants. They don't want to be the leader, but they're looking for somebody that has the knowledge about the subject matter, whatever it is, and then also the ability to bring everybody in and be a team. That, that, that's, that's it in a nutshell in the Masonic world as well as in the military world. Amen. Yeah. I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And, and, and thinking of looking towards the next leaders of the world in, in any fraternal organization or just any organization in general, what kind of, of interaction do the sojourners have with, uh, you know, ROTC or junior ROTC programs? Is it something you all seek out and, and think, and thinking of something like an, a junior ROTC program, have, have you all ever been invited to speak at groups like the international order of Demolay, for example? Unequivocally, the answer to all of that is yes. The National Sojourners, their mission statement is to do everything possible to cultivate Americanism and patriotism across the country. And in order to do that, one of the key things that we feel in Sojourners, but it's not necessarily a part of the mission statement in the strictest sense of the word, mm -hmm. but education of our youth. That is our focus, educating our youth. We work very closely, we, the National Sojourners, work very closely with the active duty military services to ensure we know what it is that they are doing in the active duty military side of the house and do what we can to develop and make that happen at the early age of the youth in the junior ROTC, which is the high school side, is also the ROTC, which is the college side. Mm -hmm. and we, we have programs that we put on, which I can come back to. We have programs that we put on that engender an interest in Americanism and patriotism far beyond just getting a notice in the email, for example, that Feinstein has just passed away and it's now time to put the flag at half staff for her the 30-day period of time or whatever it might be, depending on the individual. And, and why do we do that? We do that out of respect for that individual and their achievements, and we explain that to the kids. Make sure that they know and understand that these people are deserving because of what they have done for our country to help make it what it is. So, yes, we get very in involved in that. We have medals that we present. We present them to the students, whether it's junior ROTC or ROTC. We also have certificates of achievement. We, uh, and in fact, what we do that is not, again, a part of our mission statement in the strictest sense of the word, is we have youth leadership conferences. And those youth leadership conferences, sometimes we partner with, well, and in specific, because it's well recognized uh, in that arena, is the military order of the world wars. We partner with them across the country in putting on youth leadership conferences and, and we in, in those youth leadership conferences, we're focusing typically on high school kids because the kids in the leadership arena of ROTC, they get it at college and when they're going to their ROTC classes, mm -hmm. and, which are mandatory, the other in JROTC, not necessarily mandatory, but in the ROTC, it is mandatory and they get more than their fair share of it there. Right. The Youth Leadership Conferences, we are known for ours and, and partnering with the Military Order of the World Wars, as I said, across the country. But we also have one that is the cornerstone of Youth Leadership Conferences. It's called the Spirit of America Youth Leadership Conference that Sojourners hosts and sponsors every year. And we've been doing this for quite a number of years. And... We do that at Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, Patty and I, we are we were we started out up there as just being attendees and chaperones, and the next thing you know, it evolved into we ended up where Patty and I had an hour out of their lesson plan, we had an hour to present things on George Washington and the American flag. 
give them a lesson, and then we would have quiz after that. And we would have gifts for them that remembered the things because we expected them to listen and pay attention. And so one of them is always a tearjerker. At the end of the program, the last item, I ask a very difficult question. In the course of the lesson, as a single example, I will ask, I will tell them, by the way, there is a flag law, and the flag law says that the flag will be in proportion of one by 1.9. I breeze on past that and talk about other things. At the end of the quiz program, I will ask if somebody can re tell me or remember what the proportion of that flag is by law. And then if they get it right, then I invite them to come up. I have a flag there and I have them join me in the proper way of holding the flag. And I typically am the one that ends up with the hoist end of the flag so that I can take that last fold and tuck it make that tricorn. And then I will make a dissertation of some kind about the tricorn shape of the flag or the three, and that it's representative of the three uh, three bodies of our government, the executive, legislative, and judicial. Mm -hmm. And then I will turn to that student and say, now that I have this, and now that you've learned a little bit more about how to fold a flag and some of the other things we just talked about, what is your three favorite colors and the student will invariably say red white and blue right and this is red white and blue i hand them the flag and say that's yours and that flag was flown over the united states capitol on george washington's birthday oh wow and and that's exactly the reaction of the entire classroom wow and i, and I did that for 20 years it took us 21 years because the one year that we moved down here we couldn't be up there because we had something to do mm -hmm. but but I've given away in those 20 years, as an example, I've given away probably 15 flags. Wow. Which have been flown over the Capitol. But in some cases, it was either on Memorial Day, mm -hmm. George Washington's birthday, or the surrender at Yorktown, the end of the Revolutionary War, or some other important care, uh, some important day. Yeah. That's how we reach these junior ROTC kids. That's what I'm talking about. Right, right. That's that's the kind of thing that we do when we're reaching out to them. And we clearly, we reach out to each of the ROTC instructors at the high schools that are in every area around where there's a Sojourners chapter. Mm -hmm. We get the nominations to send them to Freedoms Foundation. We, National Sojourners, pay for that. The, the thing, the limiting factor in some cases, mind you, some cases, not all, right. is transportation. We may be able to supplement the transportation. That gets into the Internal Revenue Code and the tax-exempt status that we have and whether we legally can do it or not. Yeah, all the red tape, yeah. We have to do that, but we have to be careful of that. For sure. We do that. We've had kids come in where a chapter will host and sponsor them from Hawaii and Alaska. Wow. We get them across the entire 50 United States. Yeah, you, when you mentioned about learning how to fold the flag, I remember learning how to do that. My my father, who passed away a few years ago, he was career military and um, lived in northern Germany for four and a half years. This was back in the 80s. And the yes. uh, the elementary school that my sister and I went to, you know, obviously DOD school, when you had the opportunity to put the flag up in the morning and take it down in the afternoon. That was one of the, that was the first thing you learned how to do properly. And that was, I think about all those little experiences of being a, a military brat and things like that, that were, that were a lot of fun and really cool to learn. And that, those are the kinds of things that we teach the kids at yeah. Freedom Foundation or any other location for that matter at youth leadership conferences. So uh, the short answer, yes, we fully engage. Right. <laughs> a year and a half ago, I will mention to you, a year and a half ago, I got a call from New York. And there was a what is a master counselor up there huh? in New York and wanted me to make a presentation of s some history of New York and the Revolutionary War. I put on a program for about 45 minutes talking to them about that. And then at the end, they said, wow, this is just so great. And I had told them that this is just scratching the surface. There's much more. And I said, could you do another one? 
I said, sure, I'll absolutely do that. And we arranged it. Again, it it wasn't Zoom, but it was the equivalent. I could call, right. they could hear me. Right. I didn't have a way to show them anything like we do in Zoom with the video now. But Sure, yeah. But anyway. You talked about a moment ago, there were two other, two things that you mentioned that if you could, if you could expand upon a little bit for us. Again, the National Sojourners takes its great pride in, uh, if you will, mm -hmm. is that we have flagged programs that we like to present. We will present it, interestingly enough, typically kids have to be somewhere around eight or nine years old and all the way up to senior citizens' homes that we will okay. go to, okay? We put these flag programs, the reason I say eight or nine years old, kids any younger than that can't appreciate the value and the importance of them. They see it and they see it for entertainment. We have right. one program, it's called the historical flag, excuse me, historical flag program. That flag program, we will put on at Boy Scouts meetings and Cub Scouts meetings. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is, in the, you'll remember in the American history, there are lots and lots of flags that had some picture on it that was a subject of the time and and, and uh, it was important. Uh, the Washington's cruisers flag, for example, was a pine tree on a white flag, mm -hmm. a green pine tree, and on the bottom it said, don't tread on me. And the same is true for the Gadsden flag, the coiled rattlesnake. Yep. And there, you know, I could go on and on, but that's presenting the program to you. Right. Anyway, <laughs> but that's an example of the younger kids. They like to see it. They like to see the gee whiz of an anchor on a thing or on the flag, or they like to see the pine tree, or they like to see the rattlesnake. Right. The first baby jack is the one where the uh, rattlesnake is stretched out. And it's the alternate red and white stripes, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. The kids get it like that. But we have other programs, um, probably from a program, I say program in the loosest sense of the word. Right. What we're probably more known for than anything is the toast to the flag. I don't know whether you've heard the toast to the flag. I'm not familiar with that. You know, give us give us some insight on it. I, I I can tell you the short version of the story is that there was a time back in World War I where, interestingly enough, since we're talking Washington, D.C., metropolitan area a bit, that the Washington, the Evening Star newspaper, which is right there on Pennsylvania Avenue, Evening Star newspaper, the building is, uh, they're, they've since become defunct, that newspaper. A war correspondent, a, a cub reporter, was sent by the Evening Star to go over to France and see what was going on over there. To make a long story short, he went over, he saw it, he experienced it, all the carnage and the like, saw all the battlefields, saw all of the flags of the Allied forces laying in the fields, including the American flag, brought him to tears. He came back, told his boss, said, by the way, on my way back, I wrote this little poem. And he said... I'd just like for you to know about that. And he liked it. And so as years evolved, he, the author, by the way, his name was John J. Daly, D-A-L-Y. And John J. Daly knew of the Masons, knew of the Masonic fraternity. He was not a Mason, but he also knew of National Sojourners. And our mm -hmm. headquarters, by the way, is at the time, was in Alexandria, and he knew of it. So he gave us the copyright for the Toast of the Flag about 1976. And so it, that is very much a key to what we will put that on anywhere at any time with the beck and will and pleasure of whoever it is. Right. Anywhere. In fact, we do color guards and many times, oh, uh, well, okay, I'm, my mind is racing now. <laughs> but we'll present it in blue lodges. We'll present it at installations. Um, we'll go to any group that meets that uh, would like to have it presented. I, it takes a minute and five seconds, roughly. I could do it if you have the time, but I'll wait until you tell me you do or don't. But I could do that in about an, a minute, minute and five. Sure. The real genuine program that we have 
is the building of the flag program. And that is one that is informative to every age at any time. There's always a something that they learn out of that. And they and we get that same comment every time we make that presentation. Even when we go to a location, we've already presented it mm -hmm. and repeat it to them. They say, you know, I remember you doing this program, but I didn't remember this because it's just replete with interesting facts and information. And it's called the building of the flag. Then we also have the folding of the flag program. There is right. a it's a little bit different than what I was describing to you at the Youth Leadership Conference because we just go through the motions of folding it. I don't give the first fold represents, the second fold represents, that kind of a thing. I don't do that uh, at the Youth Leadership Conferences, but we the program itself does do that. And we have another one that's called When Duty's Done, and it's a very respectful retirement of a flag that's no longer serviceable or if it's a special flag and it's being retired to a place of distinction or a place of display for public people, the general public to see, we that's a part of this program. It, it takes that into consideration. But in some cases, when duty's done, they're unserviceable. We give them a very respectful burning, and that's how we retire the flag. But we get ourselves involved in, there's programs that other people do. And we get ourselves involved in those programs. We'll do color guards and parades anywhere. Right. All they have to do is ask us. And sometimes we'll get proactive about it and engage and call the parade commission and say, hey, we'd like to present uh, a color guard. Uh -huh. And you tell us how many, but we can do as many as five. You know, you have two color guards, literally, on each side and have a bank that would include the American flag, the Bennington flag, and the state flag, for example. Uh -huh. That kind of a thing. And then we also have uh, have participated many, many times across the country in what they call the massing of colors. And different organizations sponsor and host that depending on where you are. It right. could be the American Legion. Uh, it could be the Veterans of Foreign Wars or so on. Patty and I participated in the one that they conduct up there at uh, Annapolis. They do the massing of colors uh, where everybody is outside and marches when the weather's permissible. Is that it, not to not to interrupt you? Is that at the Naval Academy? Yes, at the Naval Academy. You just stole my line. Was, <laughs> what we do is we march on the grounds of the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. and we march. We march up to and into the Naval Academy Chapel, and we put about we've I've seen as many as four or five hundred people in there with flags. Wow. Yeah. With That's just with flags. Wow, there's that's impressive. Other, there's other people just watching. Um, but uh, anyway, th that's an example of the things that we do and the engagements that we have in in flags and flag presentations. Right. Let's see, earlier in the conversation, very early in the conversation, I had mentioned the Heroes of 76, and I said we would come back to that. Now we're coming back to it. <laughs> and... Masonic organizations, as you know only too well, uh, you get involved, and when you get involved and you participate, you get rewarded many times for the work that you do. Analogy to it without drawing too close a parallel, but in the Scottish Rite, you get your 33rd degree, excuse me, your 32nd degree cap, and you work hard and you do the things that are necessary to participate in reunions and mm -hmm. um, attending meetings and engaging in the activities of the Valley. And then you, one day you get told that you have been uh, submitted for and approved for the KCCH, Knight Commander of the Court of Honor. And you attend the, the investiture and your black hat becomes a red hat. And if you continue to do very good things, then your red hat may, but not necessarily, but may become a white hat. Well, that's pretty much the same in the National Sojourners. You come to work in National Sojourners, you do lots and lots of things that are Americanism driven and patriotic driven. You get engaged in uh, flag programs, parades, uh, color guards, and just any and all those kinds of things. 
And out of the clear blue, someday you may go to the mailbox and here's a letter from the commander of the camp of the Heroes of 76 associated with the chapter that you belong to. And that letter, when you open it up, it are orders from the camp commander saying that on a particular day and time that you are to report to the camp commander. And when you get there, you have to then suffer the slings and arrows, if you will, <laughs> of the rest of the fellows that are in attendance, all of whom, oh, by the way, will be heroes of 76, and you will be put to the test. And if you pass the test, then you will come out as a hero of 76. And the hero of 76 degree, if you will, is a pretty special degree. You get to wear colonial uniforms, but more especially the rosette that is distinctly the heroes of 76. So then you are a participant in the various flag programs, parades, and color guards in your colonial attire. And we have different kinds of colonial attire. We have what we affectionately call field uniforms. And then we also have dress colonials, which are the more commonly seen uniforms. Mm -hmm. But that's you, it's pretty distinctive. And it's very much an honor to be selected as a hero of 76 and to be able to participate in those kinds of activities. And everywhere you go and you participate in those activities, invariably there's somebody that says, wow, that's a neat looking uniform and that was a nice program. How can I do that? And oh, by the way, let's see, I don't know whether I remember saying this or not earlier or mm -hmm. later in my conversation, but let me repeat it. I found out about the National Sojourners by going to a Scottish Rite meeting where they put on one of their flag programs and they were all dressed in colonial attire. And I went down to one of the participants and I asked him afterward, I said, hey, this is kind of neat. I'd like to be a part of that. What do I need to do? Well, the rest is history. <laughs> and thinking of of other other types of service to provide to people, um, are the Sojourners active in any of the rehabilitation programs for, for wounded servicemen? Um, and how specifically? It, yes, it's uh, it varies significantly depending on the chapter and what they have in their immediate area. We do, it's not through our mission statement, but we obviously are very sensitive to and interested in uh, our veterans and taking care of them, although our primary focus is over here on youth education. Right. We, we've talked to enough. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but yes, we do and have uh, gotten engaged. In fact, coincidentally, a month ago, there's a house in Spartanburg, which is about 20 minutes from where I live, mm -hmm. Spartanburg, South Carolina. And there's a house up there that has a number, it's a large house, has a number of bedrooms in it. And it's four veterans that are recovering from whatever it might be. Oh, wow. drugs, drugs, alcohol, whatever. Or they are just plain down and out. And, and there's a thousand and one reasons of the down and out syndrome. But um, this particular house, it had just started up fabulously decorated, giving a lot of wonderful citations to the various military services and recognizing the people that are living there now. And they, they can only live there for 120 days. And in that 120 days, the house and the uh, people there, the counselors, do all they can to engage the individual in trying to help him get his head squared away, compliments of the VA, uh -huh. and in addition to that, to then try and find him a job and make sure that they can perform in that job and be accepted and get reports back making sure that they are performing at a standard that the company wants, or if they aren't, why, try and find that out. We do do those kinds of things. That particular house, the reason I mentioned it is a friend of mine came and told me, he said, Brother Bill, I know you're big on the flag. He said, this particular house has a flag that they fly off of the front porch. Uh -huh. And of course it gets uh, weather beaten and torn and tattered, but they don't have one inside. And I said, well, I said, what are you looking for? He said, I want something that can be put on display uh -huh. and they can see it and not just stand there and gather dust. 
So I took a flag that I had, it was a four by six folded in triangular form and put it into a display case. And it too was flown, this particular one was flown again on George Washington's birthday over the U.S. Capitol as a certificate of testimony. Wow. And I got a plate that put that on the plate that put it on the display uh, case. And then I put a copy of that inside the flag case so that if it ever got separated with the certi- from the certificate, that when they open it up, oh, that's what this is. Right. See, but it would be a photocopy. And I presented it to them. We had a nice little presentation that was back in June. Mm-hmm. And I just got a comment from going to the Scottish Rite in Spartanburg. I got a comment from the head of the Americanism Committee there that they had just sent a nice little letter to the Valley of Spartanburg because they're the ones that actually came to me and said, Bill, can you help me? Right. Which I did. So there's an example. Across the country, there are stories abounding that uh, are examples of national sojourners getting fully engaged in veterans programs at the various locations. There's up in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, at the Masonic Village up there. Mm-hmm. They, they put out hundreds of flags every Memorial Day and Fourth of July. The same thing in Omaha, Nebraska, that chapter, they put out thousands of flags. This the one that's in that the in charge of that particular one uh is currently our national president elect. I don't know whether it's okay to mention names or not, but be that as it may. Uh he he musters people, average citizenry, and they put thousands of flags out in the veterans cemeteries, and they have multiple veteran cemeteries there in Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. It's just just it's amazing some of the things that we can do and giving attention and being mindful of our veterans as right. well. Right. You make mention of that putting flags out. I and I don't think it's I don't know who the organization is just down the street from where I live, but every 9-11, this one stretch of road, they put out small American flags into the ground for all the the people that died during 9-11. If you go down this stretch, it's maybe half a mile, three quarters of a mile, just small flags lining the whole street. Is that one per person that lost their life? Yep, exactly. Exactly. 2,400 people. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's when you, from the major intersection that it starts all the way down to the next major intersection on, on both sides, it's just completely lined with flags. That's absolutely awesome. It's unfortunate that it happened, but every year that I drive down that road and I drive down that road more times than I can count, it's always nice to see those those people remembered that way. Yes, it is. That's very special, and that's the way it should be done. Absolutely. So the one thing I also noticed is the honor, honorary membership program. Yes. What's that all about, and how does one become a member? That's a challenge, I can tell you right now. <laughs> what I didn't touch on earlier, because I didn't see where there was a good, appropriate place to mention it, but just want you to know that becoming a national sojourner for 90% of the people in the entire organization, you must be a veteran to be able to be national sojourners. So here's the challenge then, is that each chapter, our constitution says, of national sojourners says, that only you can only have as a chapter, you can only have 15% of your active membership as honorary members. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it, you must be a master mason and you must be a veteran, okay? So 15%, that's pretty slim pickings uh, when you, in the grand scheme of things. Sure. But what has to happen then is an individual has to show through his involvement in the community, the Blue Lodge, Scottish Rite, whatever it may be, has to show his firm de- dedication to the American flag, the Americanism, patriotism and and so forth and if he really steps out there and does the things that you're talking about in americanism and patriotism if he does that he's going to catch the eye of somebody in that local chapter and then he will then he that sojourner will take that he'll bring it to the chapter and he'll say hey i have a guy that i think rises above everybody else 
in Americanism and patriotism and deserves to be recognized as an honorary member in our chapter. The chapter will consider it, and if they vote in favor for him, then it can be done. There is one exception to that, and that exception is progressive elected Grand Lodge officers. If you are a progressive elected Grand Lodge officer, we believe in National Sojourners that you, that Brother Mason that's in that very important position, deserving of that kind of recognition from National Sojourners, and you can do it in that way, and they'll extend the invitation to you. And if you accept the invitation, it does not count against the 15% for the chapter's uh, active membership. That That's a benefit right there. That, yeah. Okay. But other than that, that that's that's the way it is. That's where it is. And it's, Makes sense. You know? So if you see somebody out there that's the head of the Shrine uh, Legion, mm-hmm. and he's been doing that for a number of years and everything else that he does, uh, he might be an ideal candidate, you see? Sure. But that's that's how you become an honorary member, one of those two avenues. I really, really, really thank you for the time you took today to, to sit mm-hmm. and chat with me. Thank you for your service to the country and to Freemasonry. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting this podcast out for people to hear. Great. Well, cut and slice and dice to your heart's content. I know. <laughs> Once again, a huge thank you to Brother Bill Turner. I really enjoyed our conversation. It could have gone on for a lot longer than it did. And I'm grateful for the time that he took to sit and chat with me to learn a little bit more about another appendant body that you don't really hear a whole heck of a lot about in Freemasonry. And for someone like myself who comes from a military family to learn a little bit more about an organization that's centered around both Freemasonry and military was especially enlightening to me. I really enjoyed the time spent with Brother Bill learning about this. So be sure to check the link at the bottom of the page for the website for the National Sojourners if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what they do, what they offer, or if you're interested as a Freemason with a military background in joining their ranks. Until next time, the Tyler's Place podcast is brought to you by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. Please be sure to check out all of our social media pages as well as our YouTube page. You can also become a paid member subscriber to the page for as low as $2 a month. There's tons of really cool content on there, and I highly suggest you check it out. So until next time, I'm Matt Bowers, 32nd Degree, and hope to see you next time here at the Tyler's Place.